here's how it works. I learned when I was in the drug industry. Bundling. When getting drugs on a formulary. So let's say you have a wonderful antihistamine. It's the best antihistamine. People love it. Your sales reps are out there giving away little white baseballs. You know, they have the arms and legs on them and, and everybody in the office wants those promotional items, right? So it's like, well, hey, I'd love to write it, but it's not covered by most of the insurances in this city. So the manufacturer goes, well, yeah, we have that antihistamine, but we also have a nasal spray and we have we have this antibiotic now. So you know what? You, you need some of these drugs on your formulary that your insurance card, your employee's insurance card, your consumer's insurance card is going to cover. But we're not going to give you these drugs one at a time. We have to bundle them. And if you want access to these great antibiotics and some of these other drugs that are used for chronic illnesses, then you have to also take our antihistamine and our nasal spray. Say, well, okay. So the insurance company agrees to, to do that. But then the insurance company, here's where they make money. Now they have to cover that drug. That drug's expensive. It's going to get used a lot, these antihistamines, so they have to jack up that per member per month fee. But then there's another thing they do. They, do, they go to a competing company with a different, say, antihistamine and say, well, you know what, uh, we're going to put both drugs on the formulary. So now both companies, two different manufacturers of an antihistamine say, well, but we have an incentive for you, Mr. Insurance Company. We're going to, we get access to your data and we want to see that if a certain percentage of antihistamines in your whole insurance system, let's say it reaches 60% for, for our antihistamine, you know what, we're going to give you a rebate which means you have to shift the prescribing. How do you do that? Well, you said, well, certain antihistamines would be preferred, so the preferred copay is $10 instead of 20 Maybe one company's antihistamine needs a prior authorization, but the company that's preferred doesn't need a prior authorization, because why? As the insurance company, okay, I'm going to go preferentially, because these deals I made, i got to make sure that my doctors and my consumers know that this is the preferred antihistamine. And this is not just antihistamine. It's multiple drug classes. Why? Because at the end of the year, the drug manufacturer is going to say, you know what? You did a good job. You made it 65%. Here's a rebate. And these are millions of dollars, right. tens of millions. And rebates do not get put to the balance sheet of revenue. Revenue is the per member per month fee the employers are paying. What did the insurance companies shell out? Well, they pay out less and less and less, which is why you and I got out of the insurance business. They pay out less and less and less to the pharmacist, and they cover fewer drugs for the consumer with higher copays. But when these rebates come in, those get tucked away by smart accountants in a neat place on the balance sheet that reduces tax burden, perhaps goes to executive compensation. And that is something when you and I first talked, and I explained this to you, I said, I was with what we call regional account managers. So as the field-based drug rep carrying my bag and my stuffed little baseballs, okay, uh, I go in and I say, well, you're a pharmacist. Why don't you go in and talk with these uh, regional account managers? And maybe you'll have that job in the future. I don't want that job, right? <laughs> I need to go clinical trials management. But that's how it's done. They negotiate these bundles. They incentivize the insurance provider. But does the consumer take advantage of that multi-million dollar rebate? No. How about the employer? That's paying ever more increasing per member per month fees for drug coverage. Well, overall coverage, because you can't separate the two. Do they benefit from those rebates? No, not at all. So that's one thing that uh, I'm sure a lot of people, a lot of listeners, maybe they, they weren't aware of this dirty little well, world. I got to be honest with you, Rob. I'm, I wasn't aware of the details of that. And to think that, you know, the bundling part where, okay, if you want this drug, you got to take these other drugs um on our formulary i had no idea that happened and you know i gotta be honest this stuff in any other industry would probably be illegal seriously oh i mean you know imagine if it was in the i don't know the automotive industry it, 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 if it was in the automotive industry and they were getting kickbacks like that i don't know if it happened in any other industry and maybe it does but it would be illegal i mean i you know, it just sounds like mob. It's it's like a mob-like tactic. Well, it's interesting that you mention that because, yeah, it is. Uh, in no other industry could this, I, I think, succeed. But what is the number one most powerful lobby in Washington, D.C., that by far spends the most money three times more than oil companies? It's pharmaceutical companies. Okay. So that money has a lot of it. All that money there stealing from the consumers and the employers to, to jack right. up drug costs, right? Uh, that is the most powerful lobby in Washington. 
So it's it's horribly corrupt. 